Let's go to John 15 this morning. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this will be the final sermon in our discipleship series that we've been looking at. And by way of review, um, here in a moment, we're going to take a look at what all the messages were and uh, look at them. But I want to read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And uh, feel free to follow along. Very familiar passage. Uh, I don't think the passage is going to surprise us, but uh, we are going to see, though, um, some truth in this. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 now, and then we're going to come back and grab the rest of them. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, let's say it together. That's kind of a strong statement, isn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is nothing? <laughs> right? It's one of those words that kind of defines itself, isn't it? Uh, there's nothing that we can really do for it. So by way of introduction, we're going to take a look at these verses. And the, I've entitled our message to th this morning this, Join in the Mission of Jesus. Join in the Mission of Jesus. A disciple is on mission. There is a goal that God has given for every single Christian that's alive today. And you know what that goal is? Produce fruit. It's not live your best life now. It's not acquire lots of riches and glory. It's not put out a bunch of flowers. It's not put out a bunch of leaves. It's not produce good works. The message is really simple. Jesus says, I designed you for one purpose and one purpose only. And that purpose is to what? produce fruit. And so I want to take a look at this today because if we were to find the win of a vine dresser, a gardener who tends the fruit that comes from vines, what would we define as the win? Would it be that the, the vine flowered? Is that a win? No. Is it that it had branches? Is that a win? No. For the plant to be viable for something and for the gardener to actually produce something, there has to be what? There has to be fruit. So in this passage of scripture, Jesus is going to define the mission very easy for every Christian. This isn't like a, a complicated, hard concept this morning. And I've saved this for last because while it might be the easiest to understand, it is the absolute hardest to live but it's not impossible. How many of you have heard the comment, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? How many believe that? Well, I got news for you this morning. I don't see any dogs in the room, so that means all of us can learn, okay? So this morning, well, there is something in here for all of us to learn. Whether you're old and decrepit and you decided you can't change, God says you're lying. Whether you're young and naive and you think uh, there is nothing set in stone, God's got a word for you. And he's going to show us there are four types of fruit bearers. Four types of fruit bearers in the message today. And all of us are going to fit in one of those categories, one of those four categories. And once we get revelated what, which one of the four categories we live in, then there is an objective truth for us to, to digest and try to deal with when it comes to are we on mission for God. But let's do a little review real quick. And let's go back in time as we've looked at this discipleship series. And I want you to remember the, 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 the progress that we've done. I want to show you the road that you've been on. Because there's been a strategic plan that I've had you on without telling you there's a strategic plan. By the way, I've been working on a strategic plan for our church and ministry as well. I've been working on it for uh, about a year now. And I'm getting ready to show you guys that too. And a lot of the changes, a lot of the things we've done around here were on purpose. There's a reason why we do what we do. There's a reason why we preach how we preach and we say what we say. There's a reason behind all that. Because God is, is God a changing God? No, he's the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever, right? 
So why is it in the 1980s that all of God's churches changed from their objective view of God to an emotional view of God? I don't know why they did it. But we can go back in time and we can look at about 1980, there's a massive shift in Christianity in America that moved to emotionalism from objectivity. And when that shift occurred, we have been watching Jesus Christ become more and more anemic. We've seen churches grow more and more anemic. We've seen feelings dominating objective truth. And when feelings and objective truth collide, which one's right? It depends on what side of the fence you're on, isn't it? You see, there's a lot of people who are sincere today, but they're sincerely wrong. There's a lot of people who are objective today, but they're objectively wrong. And somewhere in the middle is Jesus' message. Jesus' mission, Jesus' methodology. And the problem is, the smarter we've gotten in church, the dumber we've gotten in the Bible. And we're going to see a phrase that's repeated seven times in this passage of Scripture. If you abide in church, if you abide in religion, if you abide in emotionalism, if you abide in positive thinking, if you abide in subjective truth, no, it says, if you abide in me. Do you realize Jesus is the center point of everything a Christian does, everything a Christian is, and everything a Christian will ever be? You know why? Because he did it all. That's the objectiveness of the gospel. What are you going to bring to the table for Jesus Christ today? What does God need from you that he can't do himself? Well, he can't praise himself. Well, Jesus praised the Father. The Holy Spirit praised Jesus. Well, if we weren't alive today, even the rocks would cry out and declare. Yeah, think about that. He didn't need your worship this morning. He definitely doesn't need your prayers. Because what are you going to revelate to him in prayer that he doesn't already know? He's omniscient. You see what objectivity does? It brings us back to the center focus. And for Christians today, we've gotten all distracted with all the stuff of religion, religiosity, churchy, churchianity, and all this other crap that's out there today, and we've missed Jesus. By the way, the Bible tells us that will happen. The church of Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and... What's he knocking on? The door of what? The church. You see, we use that verse for salvation. Verse, that, that verse has nothing to do with salvation. He's going to a church and he wants to fellowship with a church that has no room for who? The star of the church. The object of the church. The point of the church. And friends, when you live in a time where Jesus is not the center of the church, you're living in a Laodicea era. And the Laodicea era has characteristics. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. They have an element of truth, but they're always heaping to themselves, itching ears, ever trying to learn the truth and trying to reach some ecstatic uh, <laughs> dissonance of religious status and never able to get there. Let me say it really easy. They keep moving the goalposts. Every time you about get there, it moves and gets further away. So we've been going through discipleship. My messages, my, my goal has, to, has been to deal with discipleship objectively from God's word, not subjectively. You realize Bible studies is not discipleship, right? Because the church has a Bible study does not mean you've been discipled. Because the church has a discipleship class 
does not mean that you've been discipled. It means you've learned the methodology of discipling somebody, but you have not been discipled because discipleship isn't defined by what we do or how we think. It's defined by who? Right? And does this book have anything to say about disciples? Does this book have anything to say about what a disciple is? How a disciple acts? How a disciple thinks? What a disciple does? I don't know about you, but it's the only book that has that information. Now, many books have been written off of this book that like to go on tangents or whatever. And we use a book to help go through the discipleship process. But the act of discipleship isn't defined by us today. It's not defined by a church today. It's defined by Jesus Christ. And what I've been doing over the last several months is showing you what Jesus Christ has to say about what a true disciple is. And I'm not talking about a Christian. I'm talking about somebody who actually follows Christ. They're not religious. They follow Christ. Jesus said, follow me and I'll what? Unless a man denies himself, takes up his cross and... So a follower of Christ does something. What do they do? They follow Jesus. They don't follow the church. They don't follow religion. They don't follow people. They follow a person, Jesus Christ. They have a relationship with this person, Jesus Christ. And they live for an audience of one. And who is it? Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived for an audience of one. Who was that? The Father. And look no further than the verse most quoted in all the Bible to learn that truth. For God so loved the world that he gave who? And Jesus died for who? The Father. Jesus died for the Father. He didn't die for you and me. He died because the Father sent him. The Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the... Hmm. The act of dying was actually being subjected to the Father's will so that you and I might inherit what, by means of that, eternal life. So when we get our theology on straight, we actually read what the Bible teaches and then we apply it to our lives, we find out what the truth is. And when you know the truth, the truth of what? And amen for that, isn't it? So let's get set free this morning. So we talked about missions as discipleship. The mission of the church is to what? Make disciples of who? All nations. Make disciples of all nations, and who are they following? Jesus Christ, right? So a disciple is a believer who lovingly follows Jesus and intentionally does what? Helps others to follow him. That was message number one. Message number two was disciples live by the word. A disciple loves, learns, and lives what? If you want to know what Jesus said, did, and thought, where are you going to find it? It's what he says, what he did, and what he thought. So the cost of discipleship, a disciple loves Jesus more than what? Anyone or anything else. Thou shalt have no other, right? Discipleship's dirty little secret is what? A disciple must deny himself before he can follow a savior. We must die to ourselves and become alive to Christ. You got to be in Christ to be a disciple of Christ. Then number five, discipleship is taking up God's will. A disciple must die to his own desires. How often? Daily you take up your cross, right? And whose cross are you taking up? Yeah, you're taking your cross, not Jesus' cross. He took his cross. You got to bear your cross for him every day. And you must crucify yourself on your cross daily so that you can follow Jesus. And then finally, number six, a disciple follows Jesus. And a disciple is one who follows Jesus no matter what. No matter what. No matter how they feel, no matter how they think, no matter how, what obstacles might be in their way, no matter what's blocking their faith, they will persevere and will go through the trial. Why? Because they're objectively focused on one person. Who is it? Jesus Christ. By the way, the essence of Hebrews 12, I quoted in my prayer, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, 
who for the joy that was laid before him endured his what? Endured his cross. And he despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him this morning, because you haven't yet persevered or suffered such contradiction of sinners against yourself. So he's telling us that he suffered. He went through things for us to please the Father, but he went through them first so that we might be more than just participants. We can actually be overcomers in the things of God. And that leads us to the final message today that we're going to look at. And the final message is simply this one that we find in John chapter 15. And by the way, if you miss some of the sermons in this series, you can go on YouTube and all that stuff. But I don't know, many of you know this, but we're on iTunes, Anchor, and uh, Anchor, iTunes, Spotify, as podcasts as well. So you can listen to them. Just search uh, Faith Sermons and Studies, and uh, you can find the messages there on iTunes. So let's jump into the passage of Scripture then, shall we? Um, The verse starts out saying what? I am the vine. Jesus is defining himself. I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. By saying that Jesus was a vine, Jesus was employing an image that is so familiar to the Jews, his followers. He often used elements from nature to illustrate his teaching. He used water. He used seeds. He used soil. He used weed. He used fig trees. He used flowers. He used birds. But grapes have always been central to what Israel is. You remember when children of Israel were going to come in and they were going to look at Jericho and consider taking Jericho? Do you remember what the spies reported and what the spies brought back? What did they bring back? Huge grapes. Grapes that were massive. It took multiple guys to carry the grapes. They were so big. They were the biggest grapes anybody ever saw. So Israel at one time was one of the biggest producers of wild grapes and intentional grapes in the world. They were, they were huge at this. Matter of fact, some of the old money of Israel has grapes on it because it was a symbol of Israel. Matter of fact, over top of the temple area, as you would have gone through the gate to get into the temple, one of the symbols above the temple gate was a vine with massive grapes hanging off of it. So Jesus in his culture, as he's walking around, it would be like us walking around and walking by cornfields and soybeans and saying, hey, I am the stalk and you are the corn. And, you know, he used what was around him that was visible for them to understand what he was about to teach them. We began this, this morning by reading Psalm 80. And I want you to look at verse 8 with me here because... We blew over it in the narrative, but I want you to see the truth that's being taught here in comparison to what's being taught to us in John chapter 15 as well. Verse 8 says, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted it. Who's, who's the vine in the picture here? It's Israel, isn't it? Who came out of Egypt? Israel. Israel. So this is the Israelites. Now the word vine here is being used as an entire plant, okay? Not just a branch, not just the trunk, but the entire branch, the entire grapevine, if you will, okay? If you were talking about multiple grapevines, you'd call it a what? Grapevine, right? Grapevines, plural. So here, you brought a vine, singular vine, you brought a plant, if you will, out of Egypt, and you drove it out of the nations, and you planted this plant. Now, the problem is, unfortunately, if the plant is neglected, what's going to happen to it? It's going to die. It's going to end up going wild, growing however it wants, and it's going to lose its fruit. Well, look at what Psalm 80, verses 12 and 13 said then. Then why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way may pluck its fruit? Talking about what city, what city's walls were torn down? Jerusalem, right? And now the fruit of Jerusalem is being plucked from the vine, The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that are in the field are feeding on it. So what is the word picture here? God planted a plant out in the wilderness in Jerusalem. He began to grow his plant. The walls fell down on the plant. And because the walls fell down, any nation who wanted to come in and ravish the the spoils of Jerusalem could do it, right? So what did they do? They did it. That's what they did. They ravished Israel. They stole the spoils. They ate the fruit, but they left remnants of the vine behind. So this morning, I want to talk to you about God's grape expectations. Okay? 
You've heard the story of great expectations, right? These are God's grape expectations. So what does God say specifically when it comes to grapes and producing fruit? What are his expectations? Well, we can start in the Old Testament. Why don't we do that? Jeremiah chapter 21 helps us out, or chapter 2, verse 21, helps us out with that. It says this, Yet I planted you a choice vine, wholly of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Remember, a vine left to itself will do what? It'll just grow wild. There'll be no organization to it, no fruit bearing to it. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, we continue to see this idea of a vine being something of importance. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So if you're going to be fruitful, what's it, how many fruit does it produce? One or more? More. Multiply, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that lives on the earth. So then we can conclude this. Since a disciple must exhibit fruit, it must come then from faithfully following Jesus. If we're going to produce fruit, you're not going to produce fruit apart from faithfully following Christ. Or could we say it this way, abiding in Christ. So a Christ follower who does not produce fruit is by best a contradiction of terms. I'm a Christ producer. Well, if you're a Christ producer and you don't produce little Christ, what are you? Kind of a contradiction, right? Kind of a, kind of a contradiction. Let's, let's see if the Bible would agree with us here. Shall we do that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 19. Watch what happens here. And seeing the fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, what? May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And what happened? No more fruit. And what good's a fig tree that doesn't produce figs? It is unnatural for a follower of Christ to be unfruitful. It's unnatural for a follower of Christ to be unfruitful. After leaving the upper room when they celebrated the Last Supper, and if you ever wanted to know, um, if you never actually stopped and looked at the chronology of how Scripture works, when was John 15 given? In the timeline of Jesus, where is it? Most people have no idea. Right before his crucifixion, specifically it occurs between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where John 15's at. Between those two events. So they left the upper room. They just had the Lord's Supper in which they took what? Bread and juice of the, juice of the vine, right? And they just partook of that. And they're walking out. And now as they're walking from the upper room, they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they're walking down to the Garden of Gethsemane, what are the odds they pass some grapes? What would be the odds they'd pass a grape vineyard? Massive, Right? So as Jesus is walking along, he sees these grapes. During that time of year, there would have been a full moon casting light down on the ground during the time of the upper, the upper room feeding of the, uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, they're walking past all these vineyards. And as they're descending down the lower slopes of the hill, it's possible and probable that Jesus would have stopped looked at a vine, walked over to it, grabbed one of the branches, held it in his hand, and said, I am the vine, and you are the... This is a visual object of lesson. This isn't a story. This isn't a parable. This is actually happening real time between the moment they left the upper room and the moment that they're going into the Garden of Gethsemane. So let's talk about the characters in the vineyard then. Because there's three. The first one given to us is Jesus is the true vine. The word vine literally means root or trunk. Jesus says, I am the root system and I am the trunk of the vine. What do the roots and the trunk do for the plant? It's the life. It pulls the nutrients and water out of the ground, puts it up through the trunk, disperses it out to what? The branches. Listen to what Isaiah 53 and verse 2 says. It says, for he grew up before him like a young what? plant like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him how many of you ever walked up to a grapevine and was like wow that is a good looking trunk 
That trunk, that thing's got to produce some massive branches. Look at that thing. Nobody looks at the trunk. Nobody cares about the trunk. Nobody looks at roots. They don't care about the roots. What do you look at? I want to see the leaves. I want to see the flowers. I really want to see the fruit. I want to see what it produces. A healthy plant produces fruit. In contrast to faithfulness and the fruitlessness of Israel, Jesus and fulf- Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that they were not. Jesus basically is telling them this. I myself am the real one. The, the word, the true vine, means that he is the trustworthy one, the genuine one, the one who is real. This claim of Jesus is really the manifestation of his messiahship. This is Jesus saying, I am God. I am Jehovah. I am the sustenance of life of Israel. I am the one that came to save the people from their sins. There's more going on here. This is the seventh time in the Gospel of John that Jesus used the phrase, I am. You know what the rest of the word? Let me give them to you. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am harkens back to Moses' encounter at the burning fiery bush when God self-identified himself as who? I am that I am. I'm Alpha, I'm Omega. I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm the only one of ever existence. By the way, go back to John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only one of what? Ever existence. The only one of, the I am is right there in John 3, 16. My only begotten son. The father is the farmer, number two. The vine dresser is literally the one who farms or tills the ground. The gardener's primary, primary task is to grow grapes, not vines. How how long would a guy keep his job out in California in wine country if all he concentrated on was growing vines? How long would the winery be in business if his main job was to produce flowers and vines? He's not going to be in business long. He's not going to survive very long. The goal... is very different between a person who has a flower garden and a person who's a vine dresser. Flower gardens want to see what? Flowers. What if you're a grape harvester that likes to see flowers? What's the problem going to be? You're never going to get product. You're never going to be able to produce anything else. A a vineyard maintainer, a husbandman, a vine dresser doesn't, isn't really interested in the branch. He's interested in what? The fruit that comes from the branch. So let's look at this in depth then, because number three, we are the branches. We're the branches. And if we faithfully follow Jesus, he, this is what the passage says, if we faithfully follow Jesus, he will make you fruitful. Now, that's some good news. You know why? How many of us have tried to produce fruit on our own and it doesn't work? You know why? Apart from me, you can do, he tells us. You try to do it in your power, your way, your religion, your strength, your thoughts, your emotions, you're dead. You're done. You will produce nothing. But if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce fruit. That's the teaching of the passage here. Now, before you say, well, wait a second, Pastor Joe, that's, that's not totally true because the first branch is cut off and it's burned. So does that mean we can lose our salvation? And how many of you have heard somebody try to promote this? I'm going to fix this theology on this one once and for all for us, okay? Because the Bible's always in context, right? Any text out of context is a pretext for what? Heresy. Let me ask you a question. Does John 13 come before John 15? Right? John 13. This is not a trick question. John 13 comes before John 15, right? What occurred in John 13? 
You're like, I don't know. I've got to flip back in my Bible and look. You've got the unfair advantage of knowing this ahead of time. In John chapter 13, Judas made a decision, didn't he? What decision did Judas make? To betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Did Judas do miracles? Yes. Did Judas walk with Jesus Christ and was he a religious guy? Yes. Was Judas saved? No. Judas was not saved. John 15, verse 2, the very first characteristic of the branch is describing Judas. That is, those who are religious, those who go through the motions of religiosity, but don't know the object of Jesus Christ. That means this, they have a form of religion, but they're not real. That's why they look like a branch, they act like a branch, but what don't they do? They don't produce fruit. And if they don't produce fruit, then what is it? It's bogus. It's not a real fruit-producing plant. And if it's a real fruit-producing plant, what is it tied into? Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's in the vine. It's grafted to the vine. It's getting nutrients from the vine. So I mentioned that there are four types of fruit mentioned in the passage. Let me show them to you. Verse, all of them in verse 2. The first one is it doesn't bear fruit at all. This is muted fruit. This is Judas. Judas in John chapter 13. He walked with Christ. He slept next to Christ. He ate with Christ. He did miracles with Christ. He heard every sermon Christ ever taught. He held the money. He was the most trusted of the disciples. And yet he was the son of perdition. He was not a genuine follower of Christ. That's why when Jesus was in the upper room, he didn't give him the Lord's Supper, did he? He took his, he took his bread and did what with it? Dropped it right in his cup. Instead of partaking it, it went in the cup. And what does bread do when it's exposed to liquid? It sucked it up. Judas wouldn't have drank that then. Instead, what does Judas do? He stands up and he walks away from the table and he goes out and he sells Jesus for what? 30 pieces of silver. Do you remember what Jesus told Judas? That which thou doest, do quickly. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. But he still allowed him to be a branch. But that branch would never produce fruit. But, th but then there's the next group of people and that is those who do bear fruit, but it's minimal fruit. Then there's those who bear more fruit, and then there's those who bear much fruit. And the difference in the first one compared to the last three is, the last three are described by a theological word we call sanctification. The act of becoming more like Christ. The more you become in Christ, the more fruit you're going to produce. If you're in Christ a little, you'll produce a little fruit. If you're in Christ a lot, you're going to produce a lot of fruit. This is progressive sanctification right in your Bible. Go to John 15, look at verse 16. It says this, You did not choose me, I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and what? Bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he would give it to you. So if, God, if Jesus Christ chose us and we didn't choose him, then who's responsible to produce the fruit? He is. But he's only going to do it if we abide in him. Here's the principle. God the gardener loves you so much and he is so committed to displaying his glory through us that he actively prunes and purges and purifies our lives so that we'll move from muted fruit to minimal fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And today, if it were harvest day, how much fruit are you producing in that paradigm? Little? Medium? Lots? Where are you at today on that list? Has your, have you not produced fruit because you're not really grafted into the vine? Not really saved? You're, you're religious. You're going through the motion. Judas did that. They even called Judas a follower of Christ. Right. He does the fruit. He does the fruit for us. So here's the good news. More is always possible because you and I were created for the purpose of producing fruit. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're in Christ, 
you're a follower of Christ, the good news is this. You were created for the purpose of producing fruit. Matthew 7 and verse 20. Thus you will recognize them by their... There it is. There's the truth. Let's look at John 15 and verse 2 because it's caused a lot of confusion because it's like saying a Christian can lose their salvation, but every branch that is in me does not bear fruit. He takes away. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and are burned. So let me say this clearly. If you truly are saved, you are totally secure, and eternal life is, in fact, what? Eternal. So if Christ gives you eternal life and takes it away, then you have temporal life. But if he gives you eternal life, what do you have eternally? Life eternal. What is life eternal? Everlasting life. So you can't lose your salvation. The reality is this. Judas was called, but he never followed. He never surrendered. He, on the outwards, followed Christ, went with Christ, acted religiously, even said the right things and looked the right thing. But when his faith was tested, what happened? Shipwreck. He denies Christ. He sells him out for 30 pieces of silver. And he's not a genuine follower when put to the test. This, this is the whole premise of James, right? James 1. Count it all joy when you fall in many different trials because the trying of your faith is going to do what? Prove that you have it. It's going to prove you have faith in the first place. So how do we move from a little fruit to a lot of fruit? How do we go from minimal fruit to more fruit? How do we go from minimal fruit to much fruit? Well, if we faithfully follow Jesus, he makes us fruitful. So there are three ways that you can grow more fruit according to the passage. Number one, expect pruning. Expect pruning, verse two. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear what? God, why do you keep allowing these problems in my life? Well, snip, I want more fruit. Snip, I want more fruit. You're trusting the world, you're trusting this, you're trusting that, you're trusting other things rather than trusting me. Abide in, not the world, the other things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not the object. The person with false faith is cut off from the, being a faithful follower. He's cut, in the, he's cut off of the branch. He's not fruitful. The farmer removes it, removes it. Those that bear minimal fruit, he begins to cut it back. It makes sense that a gardener would remove that which is unproductive because it hinders the entire plant. By the way, do you know why most vineyard, why most startup vineyards are unsuccessful? Guess what they're unwilling to do? They're unwilling to cut their little baby plants. If I cut it, I'm only going to get one grape. I'm only going to get one cluster. If I leave all this vine out there, I'm going to get lots of grapes. Guess what? It doesn't work that way. Most vineyards fail in America because they, they fail to prune the branches far enough. If you prune back to the first flower, you're not going to produce fruit. You've got to go further than the first flower. You've got to go many flowers down the vine. You say, but look at all the waste. Well, you can't have strong roots if you've got lots of branches. Think of a rose bush. How do you get strong roots in a rose bush? What do you got to cut off? You got to cut off the top. You got to cut the plant back because when there's no branches to send food, where does it send food? Down. And it reaches deeper in the ground. It reaches further in the ground and gets more root in the ground. So when the wind blows, you're not like these dumb pine trees that just fall over. You're like the oak tree that didn't. Standing right next to it. Why? Because the oak tree is firmly planted. It grows slow, but it grows strong. And its roots are big, and the roots are deep, and the canopy is big too. How many like to clean up after oak trees when they drop their leaves and all the acorns? They're messy trees, aren't they? They take a lot of work to clean up after, don't they? But they ain't going anywhere. 
They're not going anywhere. And a Christian that has been pruned properly will have deep roots in the ground. So when trials hit, they're not shaken by the trial. They know who's got it. Emotionally, they're not all over the place because guess who's got this? And guess who I'm going to trust? And guess who I'm going to call on first? All my friends so they can help me. No. Who do they call on first? They call on the Lord. They say, Lord, I don't know why this is going on. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling your friends because a burden shared is half a burden, right? Pray for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of righteous people avail much. So I'm not saying don't share it. I'm asking you this. Who do you share it first? Or who do you share it with first? The Lord or everybody else? Where's your trust? Does God have it or doesn't he? If he's got it, then hey, prune away, right? Prune away. Pruning must take place in order for grapes to grow. Remember the win. What is a win here for here at faith? Making more and so every time another disciple, another person is saved or another disciple grows, that's a win for us. What is a win for a vine dresser? More grapes. More grapes. That's the win. Bigger grapes. Healthier grapes. Quality over quantity. You ever notice the modern day movement for massive churches? It's interesting. Jesus always took large crowds and made them small. If you get into healthy big churches, you know what they're really good at? Breaking their congregations back down to be small. (laughs) If you're in our church, we need you to be involved in a... Imagine that. Jesus was always good at taking big numbers and making them small. Because he understood one concept. In order for Christians to pray for one another and be around one another, who do they have to know? They got to know each other. The vine has to know the branches. The branches have to know the other branches. And together, when they're all working together and being healthy, the plant thrives. But if you got half the plant healthy and half the plant dead, what's eventually going to happen to the whole plant? By the way, this is the exact concept when in the Bible it talks about a little leaven leavens the whole, whole bread, the whole loaf. God does not prune us indiscriminately. Sometimes it involves pain. Sometimes it lasts forever. Sometimes it takes a week. Sometimes it takes a year. Say, well, I've been through all this, and I'm glad there's not going to be any more pain coming my way. Well, guess what? Whom the Lord loves, he snips. He prunes. In fact, the longer the grapevine is alive, the more it gets pruned. The more often it gets pruned. The more harsh the pruning is. Some of us may need more pruning than we think. Psalm 119, 67, check this out. I love these two verses. 67 and 71. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. (laughs) But what happened after you snipped me a couple times? Now I keep your word. (laughs) I know. I know who's in control. I know who's sovereign. I'm, I'm good with it. That's what he says in the next one, right? Psalm 119, verse 71. It's almost like, okay, based on the fact that I know your word now, It is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? That I might learn your ways. Not only do I know what your word says, but now I want to do it. This is progressive sanctification. This is little fruit to more fruit to much fruit. John 15 and verse 3 says this, Already you are clean because the word I have spoken to you. It is the natural course of time that a branch will grow rapidly, but will not necessarily go where it should. And a grapevine, when the branch finally hits the ground and gets mired up in the dirt and the mud, people step on the branch and stuff like that, what are the odds of it producing fruit? Zero. So a good vine dresser will come along, he'll inspect the branch and what? He'll pick the branch up, he'll get some water, he'll put water on the leaves, he'll put water on the branch, he'll tie it back up in line, he might even cut a little bit off that's damaged, and he'll put it back in the trellis and allow the vine to continue to grow so that it might produce more fruit. Hebrews 12, 11 says this, For the moment all, disciple, or all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, 
but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Stay connected to Jesus Christ. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. Discipleship is all about having a close, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The phrase, in me, is used six times. There are a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, in, Christ, or in church, in religion, in prayer, in all kinds of other stuff. But the command is to be in Christ. You've been drifting spiritually lately? Are you attached in Christ? Have you disengaged from the vine? You start to dry up and decay. You start to feel like distance come between you and God. I love what James 4 and verse 8 says. James 4, 8 says this. Come near to God and he will draw nigh to... It takes half as long to get right with God as it does to walk away from God. We need to be the man or woman God created us to be. He formed us for fruitfulness. Expect pruning. Allow God's word to wash you and stay connected to Jesus Christ. If you do these, you will have more fruit on your hands than you can handle. I want to close with John 15 and verse 8, though. Jesus said this, By this my Father is glorified. Remember, what is the role of a Christian? To reflect glory back to God, right? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be what? What is Jesus' definition of a disciple? A person who produces fruit. That's it. The question is, are we abiding in Christ? Are we abiding in Christ? Are we on mission? Are we in the vine or are we playing the vine? Are we truly allowing and submitted to what the vine wants? Or are we doing our own thing, acting like we're part of the vine like Judas did? You see, in our world, it's, it's, it's vogue to be in religion today, isn't it? It's vogue to be in religion, especially if you are part of one of the trendy churches. But you know what? Jesus never called us to be trendy. Jesus never called us to be big. Jesus never called us to have big gatherings. Jesus never called us to be great at anything but one thing. If we're going to define the win in Christianity today, what is the win? Producing fruit. And in producing fruit, we do what? We glorify the Father. And why did Jesus come to earth? Well, for what purpose? To glorify the Father. For God loved the world so much that he gave who? His only Son. So what does Jesus ask of you? Give your life to him. Abide in me. Stop abiding in yourself. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. And if I abide in you, you will produce fruit. Might be little at first. Might be a little more if you walked with him for a while. And it might be a whole lot if you're constantly abiding in Christ. Remember a few weeks ago, I don't care if people are Christians. I don't really care if people are, go to church or are religious. What I want to know today is this. Who's in Christ? If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. The command in the Bible is never to be a Christian. The command in the Bible is never to go to church. The command in the Bible is never to do any of these other things that churchianity and Christianity has said is true. But what the Bible actually says is, abide in me and I will abide in. By the way, this is how you get the lady to see a church. Behold, I stand at the door and... And if any church will open their door to me, I'll come in and sup with them and them with me. But if they won't open the door, what are they going to be? A bunch of people gathered together in a great country club that doesn't produce anything for eternity for Jesus Christ. So today the Lord's knocking. But he's not knocking on the lost doors. He's knocking on your door. And he says, will you let me in? And will you let me have control? 
I'm a pilot in endurance flight training. I enjoyed uh, having somebody sitting in the seat next to me. You know why? When I started to lose control of things, guess what I could do? I could say, you got this? I'm out. And there's a way we do that. And it sounds a lot more civilized than that. You have controls. I've got controls. You've got controls. Three points of handoff. Anytime you transition power in an airplane, there's three points of handoff. And you know what? Usually when, when I was saying it, it was like, you've got this. You've got the controls. And you know what the other voice would say? I've got the controls. And you know what I'd say? You've got the controls. You know the difference, right? And you know what? In Christianity, we should be the same way. God, you've got the controls. And you know what Jesus says? I've got this. Jesus says, I've got this. It's mine. Be calm. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain if it's in the Lord. You know why? Because it's in him. Abide in me and I will abide in you. And if I abide in you, you will produce fruit. So how are you doing today? Here's the good news. You were designed to produce fruit. You can produce fruit. And if you abide in him, you will produce fruit for Jesus Christ. So are you on mission? Are you on mission? You know, just for a moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to drag out an invitation, but I don't do a whole lot of invitations. But at the end of a series, it kind of seems appropriate. Maybe you're here this morning and you've struggled in your walk with Christ. You struggle with witnessing to people. You struggle with reading your Bible, doing your devotions, your prayer life. You know what? All of us have. All of us have. We all have to start somewhere. The problem is when we've been saved a long time and we're still struggling with these things. So I want you to just take a moment. I want you to DTR something, okay? DTR means to find the relationship. I want you to define your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Do you have control or does he have control? Are you dictating the relationship or is he dictating the relationship to you? And then evaluate how you're on mission. What kind of fruit are you producing for Jesus Christ? Just take a moment in silent prayer. I don't want anybody getting up or moving. You can make the decision right where you are. You can evaluate yourself right where you are. And I'm not saying get up and moving is bad. But in the quietness of this moment, I'm going to give you a minute to define where you are today. Lord, in the quietness of this moment, it's your Holy Spirit that works. Father, I pray that you'll allow him to speak in our lives the truth of your word. I pray that we'll understand that discipleship is not defined by what we do today in churches. It's defined by what your word says a real disciple is. And Father, I pray that as we abide in you, that your fruit will make itself evident through our lives. There will be those affected by us living our life attached to you. That there is fruit that grows. And the older we get spiritually, the more fruit abounds. But Father, I'm afraid for some, our leaves have gotten dirty. Our branches have withered a little. And the fruit producing capabilities is not great because instead of living for you and abiding in you, we're, we're doing our own thing. We're content with just making it to heaven rather than abiding in Christ. We're content to call ourselves a Christian instead of saying, I'm a follower of Christ. We've gotten content with attending church rather than actually being the church. And instead of being on mission, Father, we have our own mission that we're trying to attain or achieve. And Father, it doesn't work in this world. The things of God are foolishness to those of the world. But to the, to the follower of Christ, it's the power of God. 
The word of God is the power of God. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the power of God. And Lord, when we don't have to worry about whether or not you're in charge, we know you are. We go from living in fear and living in the moment to living objectively for Jesus Christ. We, we begin to not be worried about what people think so much as far as, as much as we are consumed with what they need. They need a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Father, help us to see outside of ourselves today. Help us to see outside of religion today. And help us to see outside of the church today where people are. Help us to come alongside those that are producing little fruit, those of us that have more fruit. And may we help them in their walk to abide in you so that they can produce more fruit because of what you're doing in their life through them. Because Father, in the end, we're only channels. We're just conduit. Branches for the, for, to the fruit is just conduit of, na- of, of nutrients and life that are needed to produce that fruit. So Father, help us to be open channels. Help our arteries to be clear from sin and be clear from the world and be alive and, 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 and vital to feeding and, and, and growing fruit out at the end of our branches. And Father, may we learn that this passage of Scripture here isn't about how we perform, but it really is a testimony of how you perform through us. And that, Father, as the fruit inspectors, it's not that we're, produ- we're looking at what kind of produ- fruit is produced. We're, the fact that fruit is being produced tells us that you're a Christian. By your fruit, you will know them. So, Father, help us to be in a position that we can produce lots of fruit. Help us to understand what real discipleship is and help us to understand the Bible studies and stuff today. Well, that might be good. That is not the call of discipleship. The call of discipleship is to die to ourselves and to be alive to you and bringing others on the journey with us. And Father, when a church does that, that will be an unstoppable force in their city, in their world, And not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. Father, do that right here in our hearts this morning. Put a fire within us. May we see Jesus. May he be the object of our faith. May he be the object of our gaze. May he be the object of the mission that we're on. Because if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain. So Father, help our unbelief this morning. In your name we pray. All God's people said.